uh, Matt Iglesias, who I haven't paid much attention to. You know, he was a big crypto pusher. Apparently, uh, he left Vox. He, he was. Uh, he thought uh, the effective altruism stuff from uh, Bankman Freed was, uh, you know, actually had more to it than it actually was, which was just, just a fig leaf for scams. scams. Mostly, yeah. when I see his name, he's just being wrong about something. And but but there but it's instructive uh, of like those you have your full on full throated transphobes, right? And they're on the right, and then you have your sort of like liberal libertarian contrario bro, bro guys who come in and backfill some of this like here's a on-ramp off ramp well, it was really more of like an on-ramp onto that i'm not a bigot but the left is going too far with this that he kind of role put up this uh, tweet of his now it's unclear who he's addressing this to right really nobody because I don't know that anybody would make this argument about any medical procedure ever. <laughs> he writes, trying to claim that there is zero risk of overly aggressive treatment in the gender dysphoria space is not just going to be tenable. Read about any other area of the American healthcare system. And this is, he's citing a, a Washington Examiner piece. Super now, credible. Well, let's just assume that the piece is credible, okay? You know, but first off, we should tell you that the piece is, well, we'll get to that in a second. Trying to claim there's zero risk. Who does this? Who claims there's zero risk of aggressment treatment in, aggressive treatment in the gender dysphoria space? No, no one. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why no one does this. Because anybody with half a brain knows that in every single space of selective surgery, elective surgery, I should say, there is um, a risk. There is risk. Yeah, there's in, a whole show called Botched uh, on television, which is just about elective plastic surgeries gone wrong. But 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 it's not just elective. But elective surgery doesn't just mean doesn't mean just plastic surgery elective surgery can also mean you have a 75 percent chance of losing your eyesight if we uh perform surgery on it you have an 80 percent chance that you will not that you will not lose it what do you do mm -hmm. you choose is there regret well i mean google it one out of seven people who get elective surgery regret their surgery to the extent that they have done uh, research on on um, gender uh, dysphoria treatment, elective surgery, let's say, that number is closer to like uh, under 1%. But broadly speaking, there is absolute, no, just as a, a specific rule, there is no single thing that you can go into a hospital for that has 0% risk, nothing, nothing. There is no, and this exists for every single procedure that you could have that would keep you in the hospital for more than two hours, there is risk. And find me the substacker who is doing the deep dives into the risks of colorectal surgery knee replacement surgery. knee replacement surgery i mean on and on and on you will not find it look at this i just pulled this up like uh elective and non-elective colectomy this is one of those differences in decisional regret among patients undergoing elective and non-elective colectomy i don't even know what that is did this come from a substacker okay. no it didn't come from it just it was a i don't know it was just some type of uh um uh, study i mean um it goes on and on you can find this all over the place so why would you why would you pretend that somebody's arguing there's zero risk of overly aggressive never mind just treatment but of overly aggressive nobody's arguing that yeah. and then scroll down here scroll down to his next uh tweet Coverage of this topic 
badly needs to be normalized and contextualized with it, with our information about how healthcare works in general. Sure. Okay. Now, now, he's saying coverage of this topic, and it's sort of like unclear, but basically what he's saying, coverage of the fact that there is greater than zero risk needs to be normalized. In other words, he shouldn't be attacked. Shouldn't be attacked for raising this. But here's the bottom line, is that like every time you choose to write or to report on a story, before you put paper to pen, uh, pen to paper, word processing, updating, you are making an editorial decision about how important it is. And you are prioritizing its importance over other stories. And for you to justify saying that it's important for everybody to know there is not zero risk associated with aggressive treatment for gender dysphoria makes it seem like there's extra risk associated for mm -hmm. it, or that there's, there's a broad campaign to deny that any ri risk exists. Yeah. I mean, the thing Matt Iglesias and all these guys, they're, they're interested only in the implicit message, which is that wokeness is short-circuiting free inquiry on these sorts of mm -hmm. things. They don't actually care. And so when he says, like, coverage, who, are you, who is he talking about? Like you said, is he talking about medical professionals? Is he talking about liberal editors? Is he talking about trans activists? He doesn't specify because he knows that, like, a differing, uh, um, different arguments would be more uh, um, persuasive for that. But the truth is that all these folks, all the actual people who study this they do look at like the um, people who detransition de i'll just take this from pink news a 50-year longitudinal study in sweden uh that found 767 trans people just two percent expressed regret following gender affirming studies so not zero they said two percent studies in britain f and the netherlands found similar rates of 0.4 uh, percent and 1.9 percent respectively conversely around 20 percent of people who have had who have undergone knee replacement surgery have come to regret it the same study which confirmed the majority of young trans people feel happier and more comfortable after being prescribed puberty blockers also found that 98 percent continued on to hormone replacement therapy and 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 the point is is that like to the extent that there's any percentage of regret and there's always going to be whether it's knee replacement therapy or gender affirming care why is this a story for the non-medical press yep like because yes, of course it should be reported. And yes, of course, doctors and therapists uh, and uh, clinics should take this information to account as a way to measure how well are we um, doing care, gender affirming care prior to doing more invasive treatment. How well we do it. That's the measure in which we do it, right? That's like how much, how much informed consent, how much are we assuring, you know, that our patients are, are aware of this, et cetera, et cetera. That is a perfectly legitimate. But by highlighting the rare case in the general press, it begins to twist the narrative as if there's like some ongoing over aggressive treatment. But you don't hear like, you don't see that about like cool sculpting, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or like, you know, like like you know, you know, like like I mean, it, 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 I, I mean, I get like the fact, like, well, you know, knee uh, surgery replacement uh, is not a uh, social issue, and it's not something that you see, and it's not out in front or whatever. You know, you don't hear about cool sculpting, like I don't know, I ran into like some story about the there was like a former model who had a. And, and I didn't see any like opinion journalists out there talking about cool. I mean, that's got to be a multi-billion dollar business. Well, yeah. I, and and the overrepresentation of that 2% figure that Matt was just referencing. I mean, it's not just confined to sub stackers. The New York Times has been doing that's true. piece after piece about or at least one high profile one recently about that over represents that kind of story mm -hmm. because they feel it's incumbent upon them to beat back the woke left that is uh, going a little bit too far with this. We're just asking questions. They don't ask other questions like. For the poor trans people in this country who can't afford this kind of surgery or this kind of care, what are the implications for them? They are a much more overwhelming population because 
healthcare in this country is wildly inaccessible financially than the two percent of people who might be detransitioning or who are involved in a lawsuit against a company, which I believe is what is being referenced here, or uh, a surgeon or a doctor yeah. um, by Iglesias. Th those are the stories that are being untold about trans people, and they're not interested in that. They're interested in the two percent, and like it's not an untold story. In fact, it's foundational to every right wing argument against trans care it's just that like it's much sexier when it's given the trappings of just asking questions as a part of an impartial press and we have a we have a society that's really hostile to trans people so like and i've seen you know, these detransition people that come out i've seen the trans community actually have more empathy for those folks even while they're being used as a sort of hatchet against trans people in general saying like a certain number of people will detransition guess what a large number of those folks actually transition back again Invasive treatments, uh, uh, I am. Sam, thank you for exposing the intent of grifters and propagandists. When you say, of course, it should be covered, um, when you say, of course, it should be covered, can you give us some sources we can trust? Well, I would just say Google. Google, uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've found a bunch of just different research papers. Google a bunch of uh, Google the question of like uh, regret in um, in elective surgeries, regret in uh, transitional uh, surgeries, and just all you need to do ultimately is read enough of these abstracts, and you'll get a vague notion, and and make sure you know they're they're in in journals, uh, medical journals. You might want to look if they're peer reviewed or not. Take that into consideration read these abstracts and you will get a basic gist of like how and you don't need to be an expert in any of this all you need to do is be able to compare apples to apples you don't have to know necessarily the efficacy of all these if you look at enough studies you can begin to get the broad outlines of like there's nothing out of the norm here with these elective surgeries versus those elective surgeries and and so and I understand, like, you know, who do you trust in this in this market? That's all you have to do. It'll take you 10 minutes. And you get a sense of, like, the numbers are more or less within line. Be aware of the fact that there's always going to be questions of, do we have a sample size? Is there an agenda here? But don't look at, the, you know, the way that people are sort of, like, uh, receiving these studies. Just look at the studies. And uh, you will very quickly realize there's nothing out of the norm here maybe maybe it's a little bit less frankly for transitioning than it is for other elective uh, surgeries because probably the, the the need level was greater yeah and uh but but put that aside really what you're just looking for is like is there 30 percent you know regret by people who are transitioning and the answer is no the answer is no. There's like there's absolutely it's no. Are there people who who transition who have regret about it? Of of how could yeah. there not be? How can they, like people, people regret everything? You know, you'll find somebody who regrets every single uh, you know across the board. Yeah. Now here's a, a coda to that. <laughs> Uh, a Glacius thing. I guess Jeet here has been sort of on the case. On oh Iglesias yeah. Case, <laughs> and he criticized them, and then. Uh, uh, Iglesias responded to Jeet and then deleted his responses to Jeet because he said Jeet was a bad faith actor. Ah. And uh, oh, you hate to see that. Yeah. <laughs> and one of them was complaining, like, why are you attacking me? Attack the real transphobes. And, and I genuinely be believe that uh, Iglesias is so self involved that he cannot understand what role he's playing in this context and thinks that he's only answering that, that if he has a thought that it deserves to be expressed and that it is worthy of publication. I mean, this is one of the problems with like the, the whole concept of, of sub -sackers and frankly, YouTubers too, is that there is no sort of like filter and um, if you if you don't have a sense, on some level, an ideological uh, rooting in in 
in assessing what you're putting out there, then uh, then you can run into this problem where you're like, I'm not a transphobe. Well, all I'm doing is raising an issue that is actually completely irrelevant to the, the, the overall question, but feeds into an existing narrative. But that's not my fault. That's society's fault. And if your job, you know, this is like the same thing with like Sam Harris saying like, I was doing a thought experiment when in 2005, I uh, headline a, a piece on, um, on uh, Huffington Post uh, in defense of torture. If, if you're going to, there's no like, I'm sorry, I'm just, a, I'm just a player. I'm not a role model. You know, like you, you can't be Charles Barkley in this situation, <laughs> okay? Um, if you're going to write in the public sphere opinion pieces or say them on YouTube part of your job is to assess what where does what I my commentary fit in the public conversation you don't get to override that reality because you're some type of artist yeah right I mean honestly it's like they, they, this is not an expression of your soul you're trying to be put your place put yourself in a place in the discourse which is pre-existing before you decided to come into it <laughs> yes i mean and, and frankly what you're doing is not art let's be clear here this is not art it is polemics and if you do not recognize where your argument fits in the existing argument in the sphere and remember like why wasn't iglesias writing this you know five years ago because he's only writing it because it's in the news now and he sees an opportunity to say something that is completely unprofound has been said over and over again he's literally linking to a washington examiner piece about a 32 year old incidentally who had um uh transit transition and, and 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 felt that she didn't get the right uh the right um uh you know pre operative care and maybe she didn't maybe she should sue it's not inconceivable to me that there would be malpractice in that area in the same way that there is like you know getting leg surgery but this is a glacius sort of like being sloppy and just chasing after uh the clicks in the money and not taking a moment to care because he doesn't think it is his job or he pretends it's not his job to care where what he's writing fits into the argument and to whose benefit it exists. It's not my job to be responsible for the effect I have on the world. Yes, except for it was his job moments earlier when he decided to write this because the world needs to hear from me on this. <laughs> And he writes, Ajit is a very tiresome person, but of course it's not just it's so any other Pop policy discussion. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> uh, because Ajit said, like, you know, wh wh where are you talking about the other policy decisions where there is zero risk is impossible? Mm. And he goes, but of course, it's not just, quote, any other policy discussion where I would say zero risk is an impossible goal. I don't think zero risk should be the goal here either. If that's what I thought, I would have said it. So there he is just sit, sort of like pretending. And of course, he says, trying to claim that there's zero risk so he he's not saying that there shouldn't be there should be only zero risk he's pretending that there's someone out there saying the opposite and he's arguing the opposite like it's just creating a straw man to express what he wants to say and then denying he was saying that in the first place it's really amazing it really is amazing uh, we should put up the bad faith tweet because I like the idea of it's like it, when you're wrestling and you're about to get pinned and you're like this guy's wrestling me in bad faith I'm I'm out of this this is the same exact thing <laughs> Sam Harris saying that I was a psychopath <laughs> in the way that I was uh, criticizing him Dave Rubin saying I was rude Tim Pool saying that I broke all the rules by uh, going on on that zoom debate with uh, um, um, Ethan and and Crowder it is just a bunch of people who can't defend themselves running away and trying to take some type of like moral high ground in establishing that they're like you know i'm not gonna i'm not going to sully the idea of conversation and intellectual discourse i'm above engaging. these tiresome actors yeah silly there it is 
So, F. Matt Iglesias. No, oh, I'm sorry. It was at uh, beneath S me. Slow boring. Ooh, pardon me. Slow boring. I'm. It's like uh, when they used to talk about the say. nerd prom. Give me a break. Oh my god. Okay, Most I aspirational, wow. uh, aspirational sort of wannabes. Uh, you're not even nerdy. Let's put it that way.